uh, what we all should be is uh, listening to, uh, to what God has for us and to, uh, to do and respond in ways and to, to uh, be ready to, uh, to take that, what those things that we feel of uh, what God would have us to do and things uh, to respond. So be sensitive to those things that God's uh, placed on your heart uh, and to, to do. So, you know, one of the things that uh, we go through and as we uh, are looking at uh, the, the new year, you want to call it, we're not changing years, but we're starting a, a, a new season of the year. As school is starting again and the, uh, the vacations are typically done, we're done with our, our travel because kids got to be in school and we're back home and, and stuff and all the, those things that, that it's sort of a, uh, a time for us to, uh, to reset, uh, to get back into the, those things. Have you ever, you know, thought about that, about resetting, you know, and stuff you probably have uh, at your, your house? The outlets that have the uh, the red and the black buttons on them, you know, that to, or uh, the, the trip, you know, and stuff. And every once in a while, a little trip without it intending, you got to go push the reset button to get the power back in uh, and stuff, and to to reset our our thinking and what we do, and be able to get back into the routine of things and to to reset and and stuff of, of what the, those things are for us uh, to to be able to be back in connection to have the power that we need, just like that outlet that has the, the button on it. You need to press that button that time to connect the power back up and to be able to use the outlet and, and things that we have. So this morning I want us to, uh, to look at some things of reset, and we're going to start by looking in Matthew uh, chapter 5, uh, beginning at verse 13 through 16, where Jesus is talking to us about who we are. Uh, and stuff uh, of those things. So Matthew beginning at chapter 5, verse 13 says, You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it useful again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city set on a mountain, glowing in the night for all to see. Don't hide your light under a basket. Instead, put it on a stand and let it shine for all. In the same way, you sh should. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So, as we take a look at that first verse there in Matthew uh, five thirteen, it says, "You are the salt of the earth," and he doesn't say that you are like the salt of the earth, or that you could be the salt of the earth. He says, you are the salt of the earth. What does it mean to be salt? You know, everybody probably recognizes this, right? Do you know what this is? Salt. At least it's a container that should have salt in it and, and stuff. And this one does happen to have salt. You can hear it shit rattle on a bit, right? Uh, and stuff, but sometimes the container, you know, might fool you and think that there's salt in there and there's not, uh, and, and stuff to, to do. Sort of like what Christian was talking about, uh, of some Christians that have the name, but there's there's nothing in them. They're, they're not doing anything and, and stuff. But Jesus tells us, you are the salt of the earth. Uh, and, and he asks the question, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? And you know what salt does, right? On your food, it gives you flavor and other things like that that, that are there. And says, but what good is it if it's, if it's lost its, its flavor? Now, I'm not sure that I've ever found any salt that has lost its ability. And it's a question that Jesus asks it's about, what would you do if salt lost its flavor? And so we as Christians should not lose our flavor, although there are many that have. That don't seem like they're Christians anymore. And he says, can you make it salty again? He says, it will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You know, there are four basic characteristics of what salt is. And first, it is pure. Salt is pure when we get it like that. There is a process of refining salt that takes place. 
And it's really quite amazing to see what all is involved in refining salt. Uh, there is a, a modern salt factory in, in South Africa that they produce 100 tons of salt a day that they manufacture, produce that, and stuff they're not manufacturing, they're refining it uh, and stuff to do. And that refining process starts with seawater. And, you know, salt is in seawater, that's salty. And there's typically a 3% salinity that seawater has, that it's got a 3% salt in it. And they take seawater and put it in these big, large ponding basins and fill those up, and not with a lot of water, not very deep, so that it will evaporate. And that process of evaporation, depending on what the temperature is outside and whether it's cloudy or not, and, and stuff, can take up to 18 months for that salt water to evaporate and leave salt. And it's still in a liquid form at that point, uh, but its uh, salinity has gone up and the amount of water has gone down. And so they gather that up, they pump it in as a slurry into their processing plant, and then they work it through the process of boiling it, getting the rest of the water out of there, cleaning it, getting the impurities out of it. It's quite a process that takes place before they work to the point of actually sorting it and then bagging it, getting ready to use to put it in a container like this. And so there's a process. And we as Christians go through a process of God refining us to be the salt of the earth so that we can affect others and we have to be pure first. Yet God purifies us in the things that he does in us to refine us. Salt also preserves. It prevents a corruption uh, in, in the things that it's part of, in life as well as in food. Uh, there is a, a process that salt is used as a preservative in food. You may remember from years back before refrigeration uh, was available and you kept meat someplace cold so it would stay good, that they used salt to preserve meat. And the way that that works is that it uh, reduces the amount of water that is in the, the meat that uh, is available for bacteria and other microbes to grow. And so it, it takes that and is a process called uh, water activity. Uh, that it removes that and done, and it's through a process of osmosis that draws the water out of the cells and the bacteria. And there is a high concentration of salt that kills organisms and that cause that decay. And so it preserves. And did you know that if you have a salt concentration of 20%, which salt and seawater has 3%, but if there's a 20% concentration, it will kill bacteria even. So salt is a preservative. We as Christians are to preserve what is good in the world, to keep it from decay, to be. That's one of the things that we should have a characteristic of. We should be pure and we should be preservatives in our, in our world. It also gives flavor. Salt, uh, you know, uh, uh, you hear a lot with People that, oh, I can't use salt. The doctor said I can't use salt. My food tastes so bland. Uh, that salt gives flavor to food. Uh, scripture even tells us in Luke 14, 34, it says salt is good for seasoning. But if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? That's another example of what Jesus was talking in the same thing, but Luke described it in a different way. It's good for seasoning. It, it makes a flavorful part of it. Uh, and stuff to where it, it gives some zest to what you might eat. We should be giving flavor and zest to the world around us. If we are the salt of the world, we should be able to uh, be pure, we should be uh, preservative, and we should be able to give flavor to those around us to make a difference to where it's attractive and somebody goes, yeah, I like that, instead of, yeah, I ate that, you know, and, and stuff that, that's there. But the fourth thing is one that's really interesting in what salt does. Salt is used as a manuring element that helps to fertilize the land. When Jesus was uh, talking about this, he 
use the example of what they used salt for at the time. And uh, in verse 35 of chapter 14 of Luke that we just looked at the verse 34, says flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. And it is thrown away. The realization is that they used at that time salt for the soil. That they put salt on the soil. I don't know how much they put. Uh, and stuff, and I know too much is detrimental that it won't help, but a certain amount helped apparently. And it said it was good for the manure pile. And the way they used that at that time for the manure pile was that it helped to keep the smell down of that manure pile, but it also increased the production of the crop that was growing on the land where they put that. That it would increase it by 10, 20, 30 percent over what just the manure alone would do. It was for increasing the thing's effectiveness of, of what the manure was. Are we an increasing thing to our community, to our world? Are we being an increasing element that is a benefit instead of something that is just thrown away? As he says there, uh, he says, it's not a big use any use, it is just thrown away. And what does he finish up telling us there in that verse? Anyone with ears should listen and understand. Jesus himself said this to us. Are you listening to what he says, is, is what he's saying. He says, did you catch what I'm, I'm telling you here, is basically what he's saying. He says, are you paying attention to what this is? You are the salt of the earth. Are you being pure? Are you being a preservative for the things that are good? Are you giving flavor to those that are around you? And are you increasing because of your presence? Or increasing for others in their lives as well as your own? The next verse in Matthew that we come to is Matthew 5.14. And 15, he says, talks about light. He says, you are the light of the world. He started out with, you are the salt of the earth. Now he's saying, you are the light of the world. He says, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, it is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. See, now the Greek word for uh, used for light here is likeness. And it typically means a lamp fed by oil. And we all know what a candle is and how that works and, and stuff, the wax and the wick that's in it and, and stuff. And uh, if you've uh, been around very many birthday parties, you know that carrying the cake with lit candles, you got to walk really carefully because you don't want to blow the candles out unless you get those trick candles that you can't blow out, you know, <laughs> and, and stuff. But it's easy to blow that out. But a, a light that is fed by oil is different. It is hard to blow it out. It has a, uh, a, a basic element of being resistant, resilient uh, and stuff to the effects around it uh, and stuff instead of the candle that does. Now, many translations will put candle in this place instead of a lamp, but the actual the uh, way it should read is that it is a lamp that is fed by oil. <clears throat> now, I, I have a, earlier lit uh, a couple of lamps, one over here and one on the piano, and I found that the amount of oil that you put in there lasts about three hours uh, because it burned out just before service started, and I said it lighted about three hours earlier and stuff. So, uh, but this is a, a replica of the type of lamp uh, that was used in the time that Jesus was talking about. And it has a place for oil uh, that it can be filled, and it has a wick that is adjusted, and it soaks up the, uh, the oil and burns uh, and stuff. And this is what uh, an example of what they would have in their house to be that lamp that they would, would do. And there would typically be a, a protrusion from the wall, a rock, that it would stick out from the wall, that it would sit on to give light to the whole room and, uh, and stuff that is, is there so it could, could be there. 
and it would give more light than just what we would see from a candle, and uh, it would last quite a while because of that. Now, they could have bigger containers that were different sizes and shapes and stuff, but this is what it was, what it was like uh, to, ha to have that. And it was a more robust type of light that, that was there, and it could withstand more force from the wind and outside forces. We, as Christians, as Jesus calling us, saying, you are the light of the world, we should be more robust and be able to withstand more things than what we think we can stand uh, and stuff we need to do. We like to protect ourselves and say, oh, no, I don't want to do that. Except, but Jesus thinks we're more robust than what we think we are and to be able to, to do that. Now, there is uh, as something for you to have on the back table back there. There are some lamps that I want one for each family at least to have. And stuff, and uh, there's one sitting on top of the box as well as the box that's underneath there is full too. So everybody should have plenty of uh, lamps to have, be able to have at least one per family as a reminder of that you are the light of the world. And if you want oil in it, I've got extra oil in there that you can take home too to, to fill your lamp with. Uh, but use it at least as a reminder to set someplace in your house that you are the light of the world. And you are stronger than what you think you are. And that you are able to, to last and weather the things that, that come along. You know, because of the way things work and, uh, and stuff that, that there, we need to be realizing that we are the light. To shine in that dark place. To uh, show into areas where it is dark. And you've probably all been in places like that to where... You know, it is dark and you want to have light. And we may now use flashlights or light switches that we turn on to, to be lights uh, and, and stuff to do. But to be a light to the world for Jesus means that we are blessing others. You've been in that dark place where somebody else brings you the light and they shine the flashlight or turn the light switch on that you couldn't find. You go, oh, wow, that really helps. Thank you. That's a blessing to have that, right? We as light of the world are to be a blessing to others, to illuminate and provide light for others, to serve, to give to others in different ways, to illuminate and provide, to boldly shed that light around us so that others will know about Jesus. And to realize that when we do that, others are watching us do that, that we can be kind to others and point others to Jesus as that light. As Christians in school, as we're going, kids are going back to school, or in work, as we're back into that routine uh, of things, or in our community, it is our job to shine light around us. Paul told uh, King Agrippa, about his experience on the road to Damascus and what Jesus told him about the light. And he says, yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. As we are to turn from darkness to light. And he goes on there in Acts 26 and says, from the power of Satan to God. That's the difference. He's correlating darkness to the power of Satan and light to God. And that's the way we have picture these things in our society even. Is if anybody has been a, a fan of uh, Star Wars, you know about the dark side, right? You know, and step in. That's the, that's the evil stuff that's out there. Darkness is associated with evil in so many ways. And God is saying that here. It's just to be able to to turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Why? He goes on and says, then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. You know, darkness can have its ill effects on us. When I went to, uh, to college at, uh, in, at Warner Pacific in Portland, uh, you know, I come from... Uh, Southern California is where I lived at the time. 
And here in central, central California, we have the same type of thing. It's, it's, we get a lot of light right now here, right? You know, we don't get a lot of cloudiness and things like that. In the wintertime, we may get fog here in the valley, but typically we're used to a lot of light. Fort Loring is not quite the same. Uh, first year I was there, we had 30 straight days where it rained every day. Now, it didn't rain all day long, and it wasn't a downpour. Portland, if you've ever been to Portland, is more of it's a continual drizzle and, and stuff. Every once in a while, they'll get a good rainstorm come through, but it just more is just drizzling all the time. And it was dark and cloudy and, and stuff there in, in Portland, not used to that. A lot of the kids that were from California and Central California and Southern California weren't used to that cloudiness, that darkness that came with that 30 days of rain, and they didn't like it. They couldn't stand it. They were depressed. They were having problems with uh, feeling good and, and stuff to do because of the darkness that was there. Darkness can have an ill effect on us in ways that we don't even realize. There can be darkened moods and a poor concentration of feelings of worthlessness and, and other health problems that can come because of, of darkness. Living in total darkness can affect us in other ways too. Uh, Myra Koth, uh, Koth, I think is how you pronounce it, has written a, a book that darkness can do all kinds of things to your body and brain. And in it, she says, science suggests that darkness can do all kinds of things to the human body and brain. It can make us more likely to lie and cheat, make mistakes at work, and even see things we don't normally see. So in other words, she's saying that uh, complete darkness is dangerous uh, and light is essential to our physical and spiritual health. We are the light of the world. To turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, to those around us, allowing God to use us as light, shining his goodness around us for all to see means that we need to be daily refueled. Do you remember the parable of the ten maidens that Jesus told? That there was a wedding. These ten maidens were, were there and they all went to the wedding and they had their lamps. It's what they were shown as light. They had these with them. And that was a long time that the bridegroom didn't come. They were waiting and waiting and I don't know how long it was, but their oil ran out. For this one, it was three hours. I need more oil. It's dark, dark. What do I do? I need to be refueled. Well, the five of them thought ahead and brought their oil with them, and they could refuel. And the other five said, oh, man, we got to find them. They left, went to go find oil in the middle of the night to try to buy it. They couldn't find any. When they finally did, the bridegroom would come, and the door was shut, and they couldn't get in. So we need to be ready to be refueled. Just like the lamp, we need to refuel ourselves to be able to provide light. Replenishing our burning oil is done by daily time spent with Jesus through the spiritual disciplines, such as prayer and reading the Bible. It's one of the things why we're reading the Bible through this year is to be able to have time to get God's word in us and to be able to understand what he's doing so that we refuel ourselves. It's not just an exercise of, hey, I finished my reading and, and uh, I'm done. I checked that off my list. It's about refueling us to be able to be the light of the world. There's a book by Dallas Willard called Spirit of the Disciplines. And I want to quote what he says in this. He, he says, uh, to perform appropriately in the moment when you are on the spot, you must be prepared, preparing when you are off the spot. Understand what he's saying? You know, we also talk about, boy, I'm really on the spot here. And stuff. to be ready to be on the spot, you need to be preparing while you're off the spot. It's like the Olympics going on right now in Paris, right? 
that all the athletes are over there and they're competing. I think this is the last day of the Olympics and, and stuff that, that's there. But nobody that's over there said at the beginning of the Olympics, yeah, I think I'm going to go compete. They just decided to show up. They were preparing for years, sometimes all of their life, to be ready for that particular event. We need to be preparing to be on the spot while we're off the spot, he says. He goes on and says, we understand this principle when we think of great athletes or musicians, but we rarely see this, its application in our own efforts to be a good Christian. The key to this self-transformation resides in the practice of spiritual disciplines. A spiritual a discipline for the spiritual life is nothing but an activity undertaken to bring us more into more effective cooperation with Christ and his kingdom. I want to repeat that. I want you to catch this. A discipline for the spiritual life is nothing but an activity undertaken to bring us into more effective cooperation with Christ and his kingdom. It's the things that we do to bring us closer to God and be in effective relationship with him. The Apostle Peter talks about it this way in First Peter, excuse me, Second Peter, uh, chapter 1. Uh, beginning of verse 5, and he says, in view of all of this, he's been talking about what God has done, his grace and love for us, and he says, in view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence, and moral excellence with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To do these things. There are things that Peter is saying we have to do. We have to be disciplined in doing these things. Dallas Willard continues in his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, and says, When through spiritual disciplines I become able heartedly to bless those who curse me, pray without ceasing, to be at peace when not given credit for good deeds I've done or to master the evil that comes my way, it is because my disciplinary activities have inwardly poised me for more and more interaction with the powers of the living God and his kingdom. Such is the potential we tap into when we use the disciplines. The disciplines of spiritual things that take place in our lives. There are things that we need to be doing in our spiritual lives. Peter tells us there in 1 Peter 2, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. There are certain things of spiritual disciplines that are abstinence. There are spiritual disciplines that are part of abstinence, that I give up, that I say, I'm not going to be a part of, I'm not going to do, such as solitude that I'm going to be alone specifically, intentionally, so I can be with God. I'm going to be silent. I'm going to listen instead of being the one that's going to talk. I'm going to listen to God. There might be fasting that we would do. That I'd give up something. A lot of times when we think of fasting, we're saying, well, I'm not going to eat. But there are a lot of things that we can fast. I can fast from TV or from video games or from 
um, going out or, or from a certain type of food or whatever it might be that I'm going to give something up so that I can spend time thinking about God. I can be frugal in, in certain areas. I can have chastity. I can be secret. I can have sacrifice. All of these things are abstinence, things that I will do without uh, in those things. Uh, W.R. Ng, in, a, in his book, uh, Goodness and Truth, says that uh, disciplines of abstinence should be practiced by everyone. And he says that if we feel that any habit or pursuit, harmless in, it, in itself, is keeping us from God and sinking us deeper into the things of earth, if we find that the things which others can do with impunity are for us an occasion of falling, then abstinence is our only course. Abstinence alone can recover for us the real value of what should have been for our health, but which has been an occasion of falling. It is necessary that we should steadily resolve to give up anything that comes between ourselves and God. The spiritual disciplines of abstinence, to give up something in particular, if it's keeping us from being close to God. But the disciplines of abstinence must be counterbalanced and supplemented by the disciplines of engagement. Abstinence and engagement are the outbreathing and inbreathing of our spiritual lives. We know to, to live in our physical lives, I need to breathe in, but I can't hold it in. I can't do only breathing in. I've got to breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Spiritual disciplines are about abstinence as well as engagement. The disciplines of engagement can include study. Am I studying? Am I worshiping? Am I taking time to be in celebration of God? Am I doing service? Am I praying? Am I being in fellowship with others? Am I being confessing of my, my sins? Am I being submissive in these things? These are engagement things that we can be as part of our spiritual disciplines. It takes both. Am I giving up something that's keeping me from God? And am I doing something to bring me closer to God? We need to be engaged in doing these things. So as we reset our lives, whether it's in school or work or home or community, we all need to refill our lamp of oil daily so that we might be used effectively to share the gospel in the places that we go, to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world so that others can see Jesus through us in what we do. What is it that you need to let God reset in your life? What is it that God's telling you? I need you to do this. I need you to not do this, to reset and to be closer to him. At that point, it's, it's our decision. What are we going to do with that information? What are we going to apply to our lives? Because a lot of times we can say, no, I don't want to do that. I don't feel like that right now. I don't want to. That's what Peter told us in 1 Peter 2.11. I urge you as aliens and strangers, that's what we are. This world is not our home. We are aliens here. We're strangers here. Abstain from fresh, fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. We are at war with our souls, against our souls. There's things that are taking place that want us to fail. Satan, that darkness, he is the one that's at war, at war with us. The question becomes, will we do the things that God asks us to do to be closer to him and reset our lives in alignment with him? Would you stand with me as we pray? Is there something on your heart that God is asking you today to do, to be aware of, to reset? How would you respond?
to God. Father, we thank you for who you are and how you call us to be closer to you, how we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world because of what you have done in us as your believers and followers. Help us to always be filled with you so that we may be effective, that we may not lose our flavor, that we will be pure, and that we will be able to preserve and to influence, that we will not be lacking and found in want because we haven't taken time to refill. Father, guide and direct us. Help us to be your people in this place. In Jesus' name we pray.